Okay, good evening. Uh, first, I'd ask uh, if you see people coming in and there is an empty chair next to you, signal so that they, they can find it since we don't have many chairs up, up front for them to take. Uh, I thank you for your cooperation in letting us open the doors. I'm afraid Trinity College decides that 25 degrees is what this room should be at at this moment, and it's the only way we can get down the temperature, so I hope it will not heat up too much. Uh, you can, a heated discussion we permit, of course, but, but uh, we'll try and keep the temperature down. So if it really does get very warm, we may have to open the doors a little, uh, a little as the evening goes on. Yes, closer, okay, good, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Frank Sisson, I'm the director of the Peter Yatsik Center for Ukrainian Historical Research of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies of the University of Alberta, and head of the executive committee of the Holodomor Research and Educational Consortium. And I'm afraid uh, I'm also going to have a, a, a list of worthy organizations and some people who should be mentioned about this lecture. I welcome you to the 20th Toronto Annual Ukrainian Famine Lecture. And I would ask you to look at the program uh, that you received at the door, and you'll have a list of the first 19 lectures. To my knowledge, this is the longest uh, ongoing series or lecture about the Holodomor anywhere uh, in the world, and, and in a way, it typifies that uh, Toronto is a major center for the study of the Ukrainian famine or Holodomor. And that occurred already after World War II. Uh, the Black Deeds of the Kremlin was a joint Canadian-American project largely between Toronto and Detroit. And those volumes which came out uh, were long the major source, and above all, the major source in English for those who wanted to know about the Holodomor. Then, by the late 1970s and early 80s, uh, a project that, that resulted in the formation of the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center, that is the filming of Harvest of Despair, was centered in Toronto. Uh, this lecture began in 1997 with James Mace as the first lecturer. Uh, it was at the Monk Center at the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, but above all was associated with the formation of the Petro Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine at the University of Toronto. And from the beginning, a co-sponsor of that lecture was the Ukrainian Canadian Congress Toronto branch, and later joined by the Canadian Foundation of Ukrainian Studies, which assisted us uh, in supporting the lecture. Uh, Toronto, after all, is the center of the whole Demor Awareness Bus Project. Uh, it is the place where the film Bitter Harvest was conceived uh, and, and uh, in, from which production came forth. And it, above all, uh, since the, for the last five years, has been the, one of the major centers for the whole Demor Research and Educational Consortium, which is funded by the Temerte Foundation. That uh, consortium, a project of the University of Alberta, of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, has its main office in Toronto and also has office and activity in KU. Uh, I'm pleased to say uh, that that five-year project has now been extended for another three years. So we are really very grateful to the Temerte Foundation for that support. Uh, it is divided into two sections one of them dealing with education, led by Valentina Corillo, the other dealing with research, led by Dr. Bogdan Klied in Edmonton. Uh, with, that, uh, and with that introduction, I would like to ask our executive director of REC, uh, Martha Baziuk, to come up and make some announcements about future Toronto activities and activities of, uh, of REC, or the Holodomor Center. Good evening. Uh, I would like to bring to your attention two upcoming events in Holodomor Studies. The first is December 7th. The name of the lecture is, That is How I Lost My Mother, Jewish Narratives of the Ukrainian Famine of 1932-1933. The lecturer will be Anna Sternschis. She is Associate Professor of Yiddish Studies and the Director of the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto. 
Dr. Sternschis has worked with hundreds of oral histories of Ukrainian Jews, and she will discuss their, how they survived the famine and how they made sense of their experiences. Again, that's December 7th. It's here at the Monk Center in room 108, uh, three to five, and you can register as you did for this event on the Monk School events page. Uh, Co-sponsors are, are the Yatsik program, HREC, and the Ann Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies at University of Toronto. I'd also like to bring to, to your attention another event. You might have seen this flyer as you came in. Uh, it's a conference entitled Canadian Stories, Our Shared Experiences Over 150 Years. It's a conference to examine genocide, multiculturalism, and human rights, organized by the Armenian National Committee of Canada, the Holdemar Research and Education Consortium, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, the Canadian Hellenic Congress, and the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. And I'll read you the quick synopsis. The, the conference promises to be a multifaceted examination of the history of early genocide experiences and Canada's response to them, the evolution of Canadian multiculturalism, and the role Canada should play in international human rights today. So basically, we have what might be a first, as far as I know, uh, three Ukrainian-Canadian communities coming together to explore their common heritage of experiencing genocide and sharing with their communities how they've contributed to Canadian values of multiculturalism, diversity, and tolerance, in part through their experience of genocide. And oh, giving the opening remarks will be Paul Grode on the first panel, which is called Canada's Response to Genocide, in addition to Professor Isabel Caprielli and Churchill and Member of Parliament Garnet Ganyus, um, Frank Sisson will be contributing. The second panel, which is on the evolution of multiculturalism, Dr. John Young is presenting, and he is president, president of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and MP Arif Birani of Parkdale uh, High Park. And the third panel on Canada's role as an international human rights leader, uh, we have Irv Irwin Kotler speaking, as well as MP Anthony Housefather and Kyle Matthews, who's executive director at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, and a keynote address by Canadian journalist Jonathan Kay. So we're proud to be co-sponsors of the event, and I hope you, you can find out about registering. It's a free event open to all. That is all I have to say about upcoming events, but we have one other important announcement I'd like to make tonight. Uh, you'll notice on the back of your program, uh, we've waited for this occasion this evening to announce a new prize. Uh, Holomo Research and Education Consortium is proud to announce the Robert Conquest Prize for contribution to Holodomor studies. The Conquest Prize will be awarded on a biennial basis for an outstanding article published in English that adds to our understanding of the Ukrainian famine. A panel of specialists will determine the winner who will receive a prize of $2,000. And we do this, of course, to encourage research on the Holodomor, to bring attention to it, and it complements what HREC does in other areas. We give grants to scholars. We've given 54 grants to date often in small amounts, $1,000 to $2,000, but that's enough, particularly in Ukraine, to keep a scholar who's dedicated to studying the whole of the more in the field, producing research, and we are always looking for ways to promote and encourage the study of the whole of the more, and we look forward to announcing, perhaps at this lecture next year, the first winner of the Conquest Prize. And with that, Frank, I, I will turn it back to you. And I, I, I think most of us here are aware, are, are familiar with Robert Conquest, but there is a short biographical description that I won't read now. But if you don't know about Robert Conquest and uh, his book, Harvest of Sorrow, you can acquaint yourself on the back of the program. Now, so if you didn't pick up either the flyer or the program, please do so as you're leaving. Uh, and we would appreciate your attendance uh, at, particularly at the event, uh, which will be sponsored with the other communities. I think it's a, it lo looks like a very interesting enterprise. Uh, we have a very fitting speaker for the 20th Toronto Annual Ukrainian Famine Lecture. We have a hometown boy talking about someone from Toronto. So it, it, it really quite fits uh, the occasion. 
Yars Balan is interim director of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, as well as an author, editor, and literary translator. He has been involved with CIUS almost from its inception four decades ago, working over the years on various editing contracts, helping to organize conferences on Ukrainian-Canadian themes, conducting research and spearheading the Kalina Country Echo Museum Project in rural East Central Alberta. For those of you who go out to Edmonton, uh, this Echo Museum Project is uh, a huge territory of East Central Alberta, uh, with a conceptualization, I think, largely taken from Japanese and other models, and is, is one of the largest echo museums in all of North America, and of course is dedicated largely to the Ukrainian pioneer settlement in Alberta. In 2000, he, he became the coordinator of the cool Ukrainian-Canadian Studies Center at CIUS of the University in Edmonton. Born and raised in the Bathurst Manor District in North York, Yars is a graduate of William Lyon Mackenzie Collegiate and the University of Toronto in Alberta. He has taught at a number of universities, including Macquarie University in Sydney. Yars is a man of intense curiosity and wide-ranging interests. He has written on topics ranging from the anarchist Machnavist movement and more recently on the friendship between the renowned painter William Korelik and his art dealer, of Isaacs. And of course, here he has family history through Anna Balan, his mother, uh, who was quite active in assisting uh, William Korelik in, in, in his career. He has published numerous scholarly and journalistic works on Ukrainian and Ukrainian-Canadian themes. I might add he has the largest collection of Ukrainian-Canadian plays uh, and a record of the performance of thousands of these plays uh, throughout Canada from the beginning of the 20th century. His most recent essay is titled The Father of Ukrainian Language Fiction and Nonfiction in Alberta, Reverend Nestor Dmitriou, 1863 to 1925, which appeared in Writing uh, Alberta, Building on a Literary Identity, published by the University of Calgary Press. But uh, he has been most active in recent years in, in many ways, the discovery and then the dissemination of knowledge about Rhea Kleinman. Uh, he will be talking today, th this evening, on Tell the Kremlin We Are Starving, Rhea Kleinman's 1932 Odyssey Through the Famine Lands of Ukraine. Please join me in greeting Yaroslav. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sisson. I, I would just be remiss. I mean, it's one, Toronto has this wonderful whole of the more history and uh, of activity here, but you all should know that the first monument in memory of the victims of the whole of the more was erected in Edmonton in 1983. That's the first in the world. Anyways, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to share the story of Rhea Kleiman with you. Um, just by way of introduction, I'll tell you a little bit about how we discovered her. Uh, we've been working on uh, at the cool Ukrainian Canadian Studies Center on the history of the interwar period and uh, in the course of doing that research we uh, decided to go through the newspapers to see what an average Canadian was told about what happened in Ukraine was happening in Ukraine when it was happening in 1932-33 uh, the perception in our community was that the uh, need to be closer the perception in the community was that uh, the Soviets did such a good job of suppressing all information that people didn't know about it. It wasn't until after the Second World War, when the DPs came, that they then learned about, began to learn about this terrible famine. Uh, our research showed that that wasn't really true. There were actually some very good articles and very interesting articles and accurate articles about what was going on. There also was a lot of disinformation. In some ways, looking at the press for those days is pretty much like looking at the press today. Uh, and you realize how propaganda works, that uh, there was half-truths, untruths, denials, acknowledgments, but uh, rationalizations, all kinds of things that muddied the water in such a way that many people after a while began saying, we don't know what to believe. And when, they, when people started writing letters to the editor saying that, you know that the propaganda has won. These are just two quotes from Ria's, uh, a couple of Ria's articles. I'll explain them a little bit later, but uh, the first one is uh, written, was uh, from a, her trip to Kem on the White Sea. She tried to get to the Solovetsk Island, and a woman, she quotes a woman who told her this about telling the world about what was going on. 
The other one is a quote from the Soviet censor before she embarked on this trip through the famine lands of Russia, as she called it. Uh, and it just shows you the cynicism of uh, Soviet officials when it came to uh, the truth. It's kind of relevant now, too, unfortunately. And then, of course, is this, this is a pretty blatant example uh, of how uh, at least there were some reports about the, the starvation uh, that did get out. Now, Rhea Kleiman was born in 1901, 1904 in a place called po Poyanats in Poland. Uh, she was two years old when she emigrated to Canada with her parents and two older siblings. Another three children were born in Canada. This is a, a map of Poland. I don't know if I can, yeah, they showed me how to do this. This is uh, the Malopolska area. Oh, okay, that didn't work. This is roughly where Poyanets, Poyanets is in Poland. In Yiddish, it's known as Planch. In 1870, it had a population of 2,000 people. Uh, um, a significant per percentage were Jews. And of course, in the Holocaust, a very large, basically the Jewish population got wiped out. Uh, there are now 12,000 people in the modern town of Poanitz. Ria's parents, uh, when they emigrated to Canada, settled in Toronto. And uh, she grew up in a neighborhood some of you will know uh, in a little different way. Basically, the first house that they had was on the corner of Dundas and, and Bay Street. Uh, Bay Street used to be called Tirali Street, north of Dundas. And Dundas used to be called Agnes Street. But uh, some of you, Bob uh, on the show will remember the uh, uh, Ford Hotel. Uh, it was kind of a dump towards the end or whatever, but it was built basically on the block where she lived, uh, and it was built in 1928. These are just some images of the neighborhood that Rhea grew up in. This is an immigrant neighborhood. You can see the poor housing, basically slum housing. Uh, you can see the dates. There were some factories interspersed in the neighborhood. These are some condemned houses in the neighborhood. Corner of Hayter and Tarali Street. Tarali uh, is, actually still exists, except not where it was. They renamed an alleyway uh, just east of Queens Park. Uh, Tarali uh, Lane, I think it's called. Uh, so the name continues. But uh, uh, this gives you a sense of, of the kind of neighborhood she grew up in. Poor immigrant neighborhood. This uh, is Agnes Street, Dundas Street, 1910, and you see a Jewish restaurant uh, and a chicken a processing house uh, next door. I'm sure the neighborhood has some interesting smells uh, and sounds or whatever. Um, but uh, this is a little bit east of, of, of where the, uh, my understanding was is that the early Jewish community was more Dundas and McCall. Uh, but obviously it stretched out along Dundas and uh, in what is now Chinatown, actually. Um, the, uh, this photo is taken in 1924, and the houses that you see there, I think that's probably a pretty good indication of the kind of housing that they lived in. And they would have had an outhouse in the back. Uh, it was pretty basic, bare bones living. Not only that, um, Ria, when she was six years old, had a terrible thing happen to her. On May 24th, 1910, she went to a parade, a Victoria Day parade. Of course, we still celebrate Victoria Day. It's a big, big event. It was an even bigger event in those days. And somehow or other, after the parade, uh, I guess in jostling in a crowd of people getting on the streetcar, she fell and she fell under the streetcar. And the streetcar ran over her left leg and she had it amputated below the knee. And uh, this is why, this is what a streetcar would have looked like in the early 1900s. And you can see in the crowds and everything like that, a little girl Nobody would notice. She ended up at Sick, Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto and um, was treated there. And it turned to be a very fateful sort of experience for her because while she was in Sick, Ch Sick Kids, she met this man, John Ross Robertson. He was the editor and the publisher of the Toronto Telegram. He was also a philanthropist who supported the hospital and he liked to go around uh, talking to, to the children who were patients there. And he asked her, uh, this is what she said, she says, he used to visit at my, my bedside once a week. He said, when you grow up, you are going to go places. When I was 14, he gave me a Bible, Miss Kleiman recalled. I said I wanted to be a writer. He said, read the Bible and you'll find all the good writing you'll need in there to teach you. 
And she had told him that she wanted to be a uh, journalist, a writer, and he encouraged this in her. And I think he saw that she was a bright little girl and uh, uh, did everything he could to encourage her. But Ria's education was cut short, unfortunately. When she was 10 years old, her father died. So here's the widow left with five children, trying to raise them. Uh, and she went at the age of 11 to work in a factory. She worked in a factory, but again, she was bright and ambitious. And she started going to evening classes. Uh, she was practical. I think she went to Central Tech uh, and took uh, secretarial courses, stenographer's courses, they called them, how to write in uh, stenographic shorthand. And uh, because she was being practical, this would be able to get her a job. And sure enough, uh, she did get a job as a stenographer. This is the 1921 census. By this time, the family had moved to 61 Walton Street, which isn't that far from where they were originally. At the very bottom here, and it's too small for you to see, and it's pretty damn difficult even with uh, a magnifying glass to make out, but there is the, the listing for the Kleiman family. The older brother had already moved out, but the four children were still living at home uh, with, the, with her mother. And it indicates that she was working then as a stenographer and that she made $900 a year. Later on still, the family moved to Brunswick Avenue between uh, college and Harvard. Uh, so this downtown area of Toronto was uh, her home base here. This just gives you a little idea of what Toronto looked like in 1923. 1924, it was a big, bustling, you know, metropolis already. Young Street, north of King. But Rhea had much bigger ambitions. She decided she wanted to see the world, and so she started by moving to New York. She moved to New York in 1925, where she got a job working for a psychoanalyst, most likely as a secretary or a receptionist. It was probably in New York that she first came into contact with other young people like herself, radical, progressive-minded people who were, of course, uh, influenced by the Russian Revolution that had taken place, were uh, influenced by the fact that uh, immigrant workers in particular were treated very badly in North America and the, by capitalists. And, and uh, she became a sympathizer of the Soviet Union. She actually probably joined the Communist Party of America while she was there, but she was only there for a year, and she got itchy feet, and she decided that she wanted to move on, so she wanted to, her goal was to get to the Soviet Union. She wanted to see this uh, exciting new utopian society that was being created there uh, by the Bolshevik regime. In 1927, she set sail for London, having obtained as a, a position as a publicist with the agent general for the province of Alberta. How's that for a coincidence? Uh, Alberta, the province had a, an agent general who was responsible for promoting uh, tourism, business, investment, those kinds of things, and she was a publicist for them. She was there for a year, but she really didn't, and even though London was a big, exciting, cosmopolitan city for its day, you know, no. She decided she wanted to learn French, so she got a visa, a student visa, went to France for three months, studied at the Sorbonne to learn French, taught English on the side to help support herself. Instead of coming back when her visa ran out, instead of coming back to London, she moved on to Germany. And she spent a couple months in Germany, uh, learned a bit of German, and this, of course, 1928, the time the uh, Nazis are getting, gaining in strength. They still haven't come to power yet, but the clashes on the street between the communists and the Nazis and everything were quite intense. She had a box seat to this, but I said her goal was always to get to the Soviet Union. She had applied in London for a visa to go to the Soviet Union, but it fi she finally got the approval when she was in Germany. They tracked her down and said, you can go. So on the 23rd of December, 1928, Rhea boards a train in Berlin, uh, shows up downtown Moscow at the train station, $75 in her pocket, or 15 pounds roughly. Um, no place to stay, no job, no, uh, not speaking Russian or anything. She's wandering around the train station, some guy comes up to her, saw that she needed help. He spoke about three words of English. Uh, ended up steering her across the street to a hotel, and in that hotel, a, a journalist with the Chicago Examiner, quite a well-known journalist and adventurer, Negley Farson, was staying with his wife. They took her in. She spent the first night sleeping in their bathtub, and then they uh, managed to get a, the, some Quakers had an apartment or something. They found her a temporary place to live, and they also, I think, introduced her to Walter Duranty. 
Walter Duranty, of course, at the time was the most famous correspondent journalist in the world. And uh, they managed, she managed to get a plum job with him as his assistant and his secretary. She worked for Duranty for nine months, used that time to learn Russian fluently, and also to learn the journalistic craft. And after nine months, she started selling her own articles to newspapers as a stringer. And she was able to move out, and she, she moved into a, a home of a Russian family, working class family, a Kumunalka. I mean, uh, there's like 10, 12 people or something living in this place with two rooms. She had a room to herself, but shared kitchen, shared bathroom, you can imagine. And, uh, but it gave her a real bird's eye or, or ground eye, ground's eye view. This was a worker's state. Workers were in charge here, it was wonderful. And yet they were living in these horrible conditions that even in Canada, people on relief during the depression didn't live the way they did. She, um, she arrived at an auspicious time because of course uh, the five-year plan had just begun. And uh, uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm in, in the West, intense interest in what was going on in the Soviet Union because of course the depression was just about to hit. And, it, and this became even more so, but uh, the promise was is there was women were equal, there was no unemployment, uh, the workers and peasants ran the country and not uh, political elites, aristocrats, uh, and of course things in the West were, you know, there was poverty, there was all kinds of issues, but here they were building this exciting new uh, society, and she was caught up with the enthusiasm of this. It didn't take her long though, and it's hard to tell exactly when before she started to realize that this place is a horror story. And she, um, in 1931, uh, uh, the uh, famous Anglo-Irish playwright, uh, George Bernard Shaw visited the USSR. And uh, she ended up being introduced to him, and even though old George was 75 years old, he liked having a nice, attractive young woman around him, so she, Embedded her, embedded her in his entourage, and he, she went everywhere with him as they were showing him factories and hospitals and all manner of things. Uh, he was interested in seeing churches. This is when the anti-godless campaign was on, and Shaw was not a religious man at all, but he was curious, and uh, they showed him a couple of churches, one that had been converted to a museum of atheism, one with a bunch of old people. He wanted to see more, and so he arranged to uh, have her guide him to some churches, but. Every day from five till seven, he was given downtime where he could rest in his room. And uh, his handlers, which included Anatoly Lunacharsky, who was the uh, Minister of Art and uh, Culture and Education in the Soviet Union, and Konstantin Umansky, uh, both of them were from Ukraine. Uh, Lunacharsky was from Poltava, Umansky was from Mykolaiv. He was the press, head of the press bureau, but they spoke English. And one or the other one was always with Shaw. So when they were there waiting in the lobby for him to rest, she arranged for somebody from the British Embassy to come, take them off for a drink. She would go upstairs, poof, out the back door, and then she spent two hours running around showing the city with him. So she hit it off with George. George was so enthused with her that uh, his good friends, uh, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, or Lord and Lady Passfield, uh, were also coming to the Soviet Union, but they came a year later. And uh, Shaw wrote them a letter of introduction, said, you gotta get a hold of this woman, she's great, she knows all kinds of things. And so, uh, thanks to that letter of introduction, Rhea was visiting London on a break uh, in uh, the spring of 1932, and, or April of 1932, and uh, they arranged to meet. And it's very, very good that they did because uh, 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 Beatrice kept a diary, and she recorded her impressions of Rhea this is just a little bit of it. She is physically attractive, would be pretty if her expression were not odious, distinctly a man's woman, very free and easy and indiscreet. Neither Sydney nor I liked her, although our suspicions as to her virtue may be wrong. So they speculate about her sex life. But she is a common little thing with no intellectual background and no moral scruples and the last word of cynicism. She winks at, with sly suspicion, snarls and sneers at persons and causes. Anarchist by temperament, she started on her wanderings with a bias towards communism because it stood for atheism and rebellion against uh, codes of conduct, against uh, accepted codes of con conduct. Now she loathes, how do I get this down here? Where's my... Uh, 
I've lost my cursor. Oh, there it is. This is, this is the interesting part. Now she loathes Rus Russian communism uh, with, and all its works and spent her time trying to disabuse us, one perpetual flow of accusation and insinuations against everyone concerned. Most important of all, she told them there's a famine going on in Ukraine and in Crimea. It wasn't really true for Crimea, but she already knew about the famine in Ukraine. She tried to convince them that this place was not the paradise that they imagined it would be. They didn't want to hear it. And they went, and they wrote a big book afterwards that came out in 1935 and was reprinted again and a third time, and was hugely influential uh, with the British left, and, or the international left, really, which presented a very positive view of the Soviet Union. So they just dismissed her, but she, she knew better. She, had been, she was living there already, you know, how many years? Now, it was around this time, and we're now talking April 1932, that. Uh, Rhea began to reconnect and sell articles into Canada. This is one of her articles in Maclean's magazine, 15 May 1932, Is Russia Going Capitalist? A more interesting article was this one, giving, uh, this is uh, Russia's New Woman. Rhea was a feminist. No ifs, ands, or buts. This is a woman who championed the cause of women. She took in great interest in the plight of women in the Soviet Union. And of course, uh, the, I said the propaganda was women were equal, everything. Well, in this article here, she describes you know, getting on a streetcar is packed. There's no standing room only. Of course, the men are sitting. The women are standing with their bags, and they start talking among themselves. And one woman sort of says, huh, you know, this is my one day off uh, uh, a week, and what I, what do I, I have to go stand in line for this, I have to go stand in line for that, I've got to think, then I've got to go home and wash clothes, I've got to you know, cook and, and things like that. My husband, he sleeps till noon, he goes off to see his girlfriend, right? Uh, she had a pretty good handle on uh, the rhetoric as opposed to the reality, or the reality as opposed to the rhetoric. Shortly after that, in June of 1932, re-embarked on an incredible trip by train to the Russian, uh, to the Soviet far north. She went from Leningrad through Karelia. She was in Petrosovodsk. Uh, she managed to get to a place called Kem on the White Sea. Kem was the administrative center for the Solovetsk Island prison camp, and her goal was to see the camp. She wanted to, there were all these stories that they were exploiting political prisoners that for labor in the forestry industry and mines and things like that, and uh, peasants as well. And uh, she wanted to see for herself. Well, the city was closed to foreigners. She got off the train waited for the train to leave, and only a, train, a train only came once every three days. So she was there. She actually managed to get an interview with the commandant of the camp, and uh, he, of course, said, I'm not gonna let you see the camp. I mean, forget it. He had, took her for a nice dinner and everything like that. But she described seeing thousands of these prisoners being herded around uh, on work gangs. She also described seeing uh, prisoners who were digging the White Sea Canal. Uh, she made a trip further north to uh, a place called um, uh, Hebenogorsk, uh, where there were mines. Uh, this is what she wrote. Oh, oh, this is, oh yeah, so she, she visited these towns and uh, described how there were people who had fled the famine in Ukraine uh, or had been exiled. They were living in tents year round, middle of winter. And you can imagine in the far north what conditions were like. And she talked about how many of them died of uh, typhus, the children, and uh, diseases and things like that. This is her account, uh, headline of her account of her visit to Kem. And it was there where I said this cleaning lady that she met uh, when Rhea uh, took, occupied her room and the woman was tidying up and Rhea burst out laughing because she was so amazed that she had pulled it off. She had gate crashed Kem, a closed town to foreigners. And this woman was shocked. She says, uh, you know, we Russians have, oh, she says, you were laughing. I've been in this town three years and I've never heard anyone laugh before. We Russians have forgotten how. This is the town of the Zhivoy Troop, living corpses. Write this, you're a journalist. Tell the world outside so others may know. And with this she walked out. I was awed into silence. Quickly the gloom and fear that hung over Kem settled on me. Even the gay sunshine streaming into my room could not lift it. So this is, her accounts began to appear in the London Daily Express where she was publishing, selling her articles. Uh, this is one of them uh, from the 1st of September. Uh, this is an illustration that accompanied it, showing people waiting in this waiting room, trying to get to the Solovetsk Island to see their husbands. 
This is an account that appeared already in the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. You'll notice it's the 22nd of October because some of her stuff was picked up by Canadian newspapers as well. Many thousands of kulaks have been exiled to the north since the collectivization of agriculture began. It is reckoned that at Kibinogorsk alone, 32,000 out of a total population of 35,000 are kulaks, mostly from Ukraine and the Nizhny Novgorod areas. They work on the mountain of Apatite, the famous fertilizer, in conditions that must be appalling in winter. They live 20 or 30 families to a tent or three-ply wooden hut lined with tar paper to keep out the wind. She was told that during the first, five, first months after their arrival, many hundred died of exposure, typhus, and smallpox. So this was her account of um, her trip to the far north. And it's the account that got her into trouble with Soviet authorities because uh, it took a while to get out. She managed to smuggle the articles out without them being censored through Finland. They got to London and they were published there. In the meantime, Ria, she made all the way to Murmansk, Arkhangelsk. She made a second trip, and shortly after she got back to Moscow, she embarked on this trip through what she called the Famine Lands. This would have been in uh, late August and September of 1932. This is a map that shows, they say it's 5,000 miles, it wasn't. It was more like 3,000 kilometers, uh, this one way anyway. And so you can see the route that they took from Moscow. The first night she spent at Yasnaya Polyana, uh, the second night in Kursk or whatever, then in Kharkiv. She did this in a car with these two women. And I apologize for the quality of the photos, but th there are no good photos either of Rhea or of uh, these two women. Uh, the, they had a car, they were American socialites from Atlanta, Georgia. And typically they're 22 years old, they wanted to see this exciting paradise that was being created in the Soviet Union. So they managed to get a car into Moscow and they wanted to drive and they arranged for Rhea to accompany them as their, as their guide and their interpreter. Mary uh, Alva Christensen and Mary Dejiv. Mary Dejiv was the photographer, Alva was the writer. And Alva had cut a deal with the Moscow News. She was gonna write a series of articles. It doesn't look like any of them appeared. That's the old beater, they call it a fliver, that they traveled in. Here's a shot that the caption reads, a group of Russian countryside, country folk surrounding the car of uh, Miss Alva Christensen and Miss, Miss Mary Dejiv as they traveled through the Ukraine. This is their map of the trip that they made. There's a scene there, the photograph shows uh, the car after it had crossed the stream and uh, broken down and had to be pulled out. And uh, You can imagine, this was mostly on places where there was either military roads or, or wagon tracks. There were no maps half the time. The fact that these women pulled this off is absolutely incredible. Rhea produced a, a series of articles afterwards because uh, she eventually got arrested and kicked out. But this is her first article that she wrote about that trip, uh, which appeared in the London Daily Express and uh, was a full frontal blast at the secret police basically saying, you guys run the society. You follow everybody around. You guys have swank cars. You have lots to eat. You terrorize people. You know, everybody's afraid of you and uh, people are starving and you know what's going on. In Kharkiv, she was approached by a young woman named Alice Mertzka, who, uh, as she put it this way, we had been two days in Kharkov, but we were all anxious to get away. The great Ukrainian capital was in the grip of hunger. Beggars swarmed round the streets. The stores were empty. The workers' bread rations had just been cut from two pounds a day per person to one pound and a quarter. A young Ukrainian girl, Alice Mertzka, had come begging to our hotel for food. She had lived in New Toronto for nine years. Her father worked for the Massey Harris Company. Three years ago, she and her father came back to Russia to get work at the tractor plant in Kharkov. Now we are without any bread. So um, this is Tractor Zavod, was a very famous big one of these Stalinist uh, construction projects. He built this huge tractor factory. It was supposed to produce like 1,500 tractors a month and they were producing barely 100 and half of them were breaking down even as they were driving them off the lot. Uh, it was not a great success. She described it as a dump. They went there in the morning. She figured they might be able to get some food to eat because they left early and the restaurant wasn't open in the hotel. 
and they figured that there are foreign workers at the tractor plant, so there's probably a spe special cafeteria for them to make sure they got fed. Uh, but she got there, and they wouldn't open. They wouldn't show her the factory. Uh, wouldn't show. Her, wouldn't allow her to the cafeteria. So the women headed off south from Kharkiv without having any breakfast. They're driving past a bunch of villages, and all the villages are empty. She's noticing. She's like, the doors are open, the windows or the curtains are flapping in the breeze, and she realized, oh, these are these kulaks supposedly who got all deported. They pull into a village called uh, a village, and uh, the women were having a little bit of a market. They were selling things from their garden. And uh, she, wanted to, she wanted to buy some milk and some eggs, so she's approached several of them. They couldn't really understand what she wanted. She was speaking Russian. They didn't speak Russian, even though Ukrainian and Russian seemed very close. At that point, I guess, for those women, they hadn't heard much Russian. It was all very strange. Finally, some woman said, no, there's no you know, milk or eggs here. There are no cattle or chickens. They're all been taken by the, by the state. Uh, and some woman said, you know, I live in a neighborhood, in a neighboring village, Izumka, and uh, maybe you can... Um, uh, maybe I can find something for you there. So she goes, she drives in, and this is what she describes. When we arrived at the, at the next village, men, women, children, and shaggy coats all came crowding out of the narrow doorways. The peasant women could not step out of the car, this is the woman who was with her, until every living soul in the village had assembled. This was the first car that they had seen in this village. Then she started waving her hands, talking and explaining until I wondered whether she was describing her experiences in the car or urging them to come to some deed of violence. They wanted something of me, but I could not make out what it was. At last, someone went off for a little crippled lad of 14, and when he came hobbling up, the mystery was explained. This was the village of Isumka, the lad told me. I was from Moscow, yes. We were a delegation studying conditions in the Ukraine, in the Ukraine. yes. Well, they wanted me to take a petition back to the Kremlin from this village and the one I had just been in. Tell the Kremlin we are starving, we have no bread. Kind of pretty blatant, no ambiguity there. They continued, we are good, hardworking peasants, loyal Soviet citizens, but the village Soviet had taken our land from us. We are in the collective farm, but we do not get any grain. Everything, land, cows and horses have been taken from us, and we have nothing to eat. Our children were eating grass in the spring. I must have looked unbelieving at this, for a tall, gaunt woman started to take the children's clothes off. She undressed them one by one, prodded their sagging bellies, pointed to their spindly legs, ran her hand up and down their tortured, misshapen, twisted little bodies to make me understand that this was real famine. I shut my eyes. I could not bear to look at all this horror. Yes, the woman insisted, and the boy repeated. They were down on all fours like animals eating grass. There was nothing for them. She headed out from there further south. She was in Slovyansk, she was in Horlivka, these places that we all know now because of the war, uh, and in Donetsk. In Slovyansk, the women stayed, the only place they could get a place to stay was in a sanatorium. And uh, the sanatorium, they were in a room, large room with a bunch of beds, and uh, there were three women, local women, and another woman there, and the three of them. All the women were eager to talk, they were all new arrivals. Some had been here before, and there were many questions about food and prices that they wanted to discuss. But they were a little in awe of the three foreigners in their midst, and it was only when the worker from the salt mines asked me if, if the workers in Canada ate white bread and meat that tongues were loosened. Of course, there's plenty of food in their country, a Polish woman in the far corner answered for me. She had told me that her husband was a high communist official. What a silly question to ask. I don't see why it is silly, the first woman insisted. They tell us that there's unemployment in America and everywhere. Our papers say that the workers are starving in the capitalist countries, but we have no white bread and they do. To me, food is unimportant, is of no importance, the Polish woman asserted. I've come here for a cure. My liver is out of order and I need the mud baths here. Food does not concern me. Well, that's very nice. These women are, st this was obviously said to impress me. How can you get a cure without food, another woman barked out. That's what's wrong with all of us, not enough to eat. How can you work in the coal mines on potatoes and black bread? That's all I have to eat at home. There was a pause then. Where do you work that food is no concern to you? Do you get red army rations? I know they're good. I've got a married son in the army now. And of course there was a dual system and people who 
were party people and everything, they did get filmed. I'm not a worker, the Polish woman answered languidly, as if annoyed that this conversation should take, a, take such a turn. I'm a domashnia chazaika. I work hard, just as hard as you women in the mines, but I'm not dressed as a worker. So these little incidents that she describes are part of this account, her account. Oh, where is it now? She, after, after the Donbass, she went to the Donbass and uh, she described the mines and how there were explosions every week in the mines. Again, she described how hard the miners worked, but she also made a point of visiting a miner's wife. She lived on the fourth floor of an apartment, one of these new apartments that had been thrown up and was already falling apart after a year or two. Uh, no plumbing, no elevator, uh, and she has three little kids. She had to go, she said, where's the washroom? And she pointed out the backyard, the back field. Uh, water, you got to take buckets of water up the stairs and stuff. Uh, and this is a miner's wife. The miners were the elite of the Soviet proletariat. I mean, miners, uh, steel workers, these were the heroes of the, of the revolution. She went from there through the Kuban. She arrived in, uh, she uh, described in the Kuban in the middle of the night seeing uh, a bunch of men suddenly coming and they were uh, destroying the crops and uh, they explained that several of their, about 15 of their people in their village had been shot by the Bolsheviks and this was payback for them. Uh, she described seeing uh, watchtowers in the corner of fields with guys with guns in them, making sure that nobody stole any grain or corn uh, from the fields to, to feed their families. So uh, she passed through uh, the Kuban region. She talked about people being eating this bread made out of chaff and children being hungry. So she saw the starvation there as well. This is about uh, an article that uh, it talked about the deportation of 5,000 people from one village. On 19th of September, they arrived in Tiflis, Georgia, or Tbilisi, the capital. And um, they were tired from the road. Uh, she was looking forward to taking a bath. You can imagine this had been a long trip so far. And she, but she arrives and there's two guys standing outside her door, two uh, military men. She figured out right away, well, okay, I know what this is all about. She went in, she invited them in. Uh, she then decided I better go and try to send a telegram to the British consulate in the British embassy in Moscow that I'm in trouble. She um, managed to get the telegram off, she came back. By that time there were a lot more people uh, milling about, military types, militia types. Um, at, she then, I had, I had to go to the consulate to find out if anything had come in from Moscow yet. This was the German consulate. The moment I came downstairs, I could see that something was up. Our car, which had been standing near the door since 7th, had disappeared. No one knew who had taken her, they called her Becky, or on whose orders. The manager, soldiers, the porters all bustled round me like frightened hens. Would I go upstairs and wait? Someone tried to take my arm. I shook him off. Take your hands off of me, I shouted. And the man sprang back as if I'd bitten him. And then before anyone had time to stop me, I pushed the door open and I walked out. I felt a sudden shock of surprise to see that the sun was still shining and that people were hurrying to and fro as if nothing were happening. They would not hear my heart hammering. They did not know that I was trembling from head to foot. I walked faster and faster. I would not run. I knew that I was being pursued. If I could only get to the consulate steps before I was overtaken. I urged myself on and on. It was too late. A little unshaven man in a blue workman's blouse, the one I had seen lounging outside my door, was at my heels now. Go back, he said. Go back. I continued to walk on. Go back. I felt something sharp jabbed into my ribs, and I stopped. You are under arrest, he said. You must come with me. I refused to budge and asked him to show me the warrant for my arrest. I'm a member of the secret department of the Ogepu. I can arrest whomever I so please without a warrant. You come with me to the regional Ogepu. I started to go away. He blocked my way. You treat me as a child, he said, ramming the point of the revolver harder into me. I'm a member of a power as great as yours. A crowd had collected. When they heard the man with the threatening guns say that I had treated him as a child, a snicker went around. Some laughed outright. He seized my arm and I ordered the crowd to make way. 
I twisted out of his hold and proceeded to walk back to the hotel, he following behind me and threatening to shoot me dead. I got into the hotel with a few, ste a few steps ahead of him. The girls were in their lo lobby and I told them briefly what had happened and asked them to slip out quickly and inform the German consul that I was under arrest. Then I went up to the hotel manager and demanded that he send, send for the regional OGPU commander. I tried to go to my room, but the thug intervened and ordered me back. I calmly walked over to a cushioned seat near the window, took out a cigarette and offered my captor one and sat down to wait. Well, it tells you something about the character of this woman. She was fearless. She did not, but you know, she was not afraid of anyone or anything. This is uh, the article that appeared on the 20th of September, 1932 in Izvestia attacking her uh, for, uh, for, uh, being, for spreading false news. Uh, it's it was titled, Of Liars and Provocateurs from the Bourgeois Camp, and it was written by a man named Leonid Moskvin. So this was the official uh, newspaper, this was the official statement of the fact that she was being deported. News of her uh, uh, deportation spread like a grass fire through the world. It was reported in newspapers all across Europe, all across Canada, all across North America, uh, all across uh, into the uh, South Pacific. This is the headline of the Toronto Evening Telegram announcing her arrest and expulsion. So you can see it's front it's banner headline, front page news. Uh, it appeared in the Water Border City Star, the Winnipeg Tribune, the Winnipeg, the Brandon Daily Sun, the Medicine Hat News, the Edmonton Bulletin, the Vancouver Sun, the Charlottetown, whatever. I mean, just every newspaper from coast to coast carried it, carried the news of her. It was big news. There's an article that it looked like from the uh, uh, Montreal Gazette. There's the Pennsylvania Reading Eagle, just examples of the kinds. Most of them were just wire service stories, either shorter or longer versions. Just between the, 9th, the 20th of September and 25th of September, 1932, 76 different news, U.S. newspapers carried reports of Rio's expulsion. So this was a huge news event. This is what it looked like in the um, Windsor Border City Star. Gazeta Lvovska. I could have shown you from Spain, from Germany, from Austria. There were lots of articles that appeared. There's the Vancouver Sun. As you can see, the language is a little bit dated. She was called a girl in some places. Some places she was a woman, uh, even though she was 28 years old. So as I said, this is the, uh, after she got kicked out, she moved, she came back to London and began writing the articles because they confiscated the materials from this trip that she made to the far north. And so she sat down and started writing up these articles. And several of them appeared in the London Daily Express. This one is like Dreyfus's jacuzzi. I mean, she just, both barrels blazing, denounces the, the secret police and denounces uh, the Bolshevik regime. Uh, and I should say this as somebody, she never stopped holding progressive views. She just did not buy Soviet Bolshevism or Russian, uh, Russian communism, as she called it. These are, this is the account in the Daily Express about her arrest where she talks about it. Starvation stocks, the land, this is actually about the Kuban region. Uh, but she had about five or six articles that appeared. But the most interesting one was one that uh, was un published under the heading Crime Wave Sweeps Russia, Workers Smashing Red Regime. Well, this is a bit optimistic. But the most uh, interesting chapter, most interesting paragraph is this. The most interesting development in Soviet Russia is the increase in chauvinism. It is not from the working class or the peasants that Stalin draws his support now. It is from the bourgeoisie and the surviving military families. They see in him another Genghis Khan, and they believe that this attempt at economic conquest is only a prelude to a military one. So she understood that there was a shift. And of course, with the famine came intense Russification. Uh, Russian chauvinism sort of flourished again. And uh, she managed to, she, she, she sensed this. You can see this. There were articles that continued to appear. This is from our Ukrainian Canadian Communist Press, uh, an article. Uh, uh, attacking her and questioning her credibility. In the meantime, Ria, I said, was busy writing these, this series of articles about the trip, and it looks like she submitted them as a manuscript to J.M. Dent Company. Here's the letter, and this has to be the fastest rejection in, in the history of publishing. She, the 23rd of March, she gets a letter saying that uh, we acknowledge receipt of the book manuscript, which shall have our careful consideration. The very next day, 
another letter comes saying, uh, oh, uh, I talked to another editor and uh, they've accepted a manuscript by another woman, uh, Cecily Hamilton. Uh, we can't publish two books on the Soviet Union in one season and everything, uh, good luck. Uh, what she ended up doing was just taking those articles and publishing them in the series of 22 articles in the Toronto Telegram. They appeared in uh, May, uh, May of, and early June of 1933, so much later. After she left England, she came back to Canada, to Toronto, and I said that's where she finished her uh, series on, on the famine lands. In November 1933, she goes back to Europe, this time to Nazi Germany, and there she became the Munich correspondent for the London Daily Telegraph. When she was in uh, Moscow, she, in the reports of her arrest described her as a correspondent for the Daily Express. She wasn't, and they were very clear. They said, no, 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 she was just a stringer. She was a freelancer. But this time, she was a genuine correspondent. She arrived uh, on the 8th of November, 1933, just when the elections were on, that the Nazis consolidated their power. She spent the day running around uh, different working class districts, going to polling booths, uh, in the company of a fellow Canadian journalist named Lucan, uh, not Lucas, it should be Lucan Johnson. Johnson was an interesting character. Uh, in his diary, which survived, he makes one reference to her, and it's an interesting one. He goes, he mentions Rhea Kleiman dash bad, capital B A D, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. He was a very traditional guy. She was a not a traditional woman. She was a she probably ate his lunch for breakfast. I mean, she uh, he was terrified of her, obviously. Uh, Johnson, though, was able to score an interview with Hitler short, shortly after the elections and was on his way back to uh, London and disappeared on the boat over the nor in the, across the English Channel. He just disappeared. Not sure if somebody helped him. They, the family doesn't think he committed suicide or anything. It seems very uncharacteristic, but there's some mystery around his death. Meanwhile, uh, she then stayed in Munich as the correspondent until 1939, till the outbreak of the war. Uh, and uh, this was an interesting article, and I'm indebted to Ksenia for this that uh, was published in the Toronto Telegram uh, in 1941 when uh, Herm, uh, Rudolf Hess flew out from uh, Nazi Germany to England on this quixotic peace mission. And she writes about it saying that she basically says, you know, I think this guy's sincere. He understands that Germany is going to lose the war and it's going to be terrible for Germany. So he's looking for a way out and he genuinely wants peace. And then she talks about the fact that I knew Herman Hess, I knew Rudolf Hess, I got to know him and all kinds of other Nazi officials. Well, she was a journalist. She needed to cultivate relations with senior government people to know what the intrigues and the backstory was, was going on. She even describes how in 1934 she was at a rally and Hitler and Hess were there and she must have been on stage within a couple of feet of them because she describes how they just sort of locked eyes in, with each other and were like in a trance as, as Hitler was speaking and whatever. She, uh, I said, she, she was well connected and again, you have to remember, they knew she was Jewish. And talk about this woman's courage. 1935, before I even get to this plane crash story, 1935, there's a, there's a British um, Foreign Office report. Uh, I guess Ria was at a rally and they played the uh, Deutschland über alles and she did not do the Hitler salute. Uh, so that got into trouble and they were going to shut down, the German authorities wanted to shut down the Munich office of the Daily Telegraph. The British Foreign Office had to intervene and uh, uh, they let her stay. Uh, 1938, another amazing thing that happened to her. She was taking a break, flying to uh, England through Schiphol. This is a KLM a DC-3. She was flying KLM Airlines and the plane crashed approaching uh, Schiphol Airport. Take a look at these shots. It's amazing that anybody survived. Six people were killed, the four crew members and two passengers. She was one of 14 passengers who were obviously sitting in the back half of the plane that survived this crash. She was injured. She was taken to an hospital in Amsterdam. She recovered, went back to Germany, and I said she was there till uh, shortly before the war began. She then returns back to Canada. She was the London Daily Telegraph uh, correspondent based in Montreal and then in Toronto for Canada. 
Uh, she had a radio program in Toronto for a, a, a number of years, for, for about a year or two or sort of. And then um, in 1942, she moves to the United States permanently. When she gets there, uh, it looks like she then got recruited uh, to be a part of the nascent American um, intelligence community. This is before the CIA. And if you think about it, it actually made perfect sense. This is a woman who knew the Soviet Union inside out. She knew Nazi Germany, and she knew key players there. And she was a smart woman, spoke languages. She would be an asset. The fact that she used to be a communist uh, obviously wasn't a, a, an issue with them. Uh, during the war, she traveled around on a speaking tour at one point, because we've got three or four articles in Midwesterns, from Midwestern towns, cities, or whatever. She spoke to workers uh, about the war. Uh, she also wrote a piece about her plan for how to denazify Germany at the end of the war. Uh, that was her, how she spent, that was Rhea's war years. It looks like she worked for them for until about 1947, at which point she begins to gradually fade from view. Rhea um, ended up uh, continuing, she was freelancing, she uh, worked for a while for McCann Erickson Advertising Agency, which is still around, big Madison Avenue uh, advertisers, probably on a contract basis. Uh, in this article here, which was published in 1969 in the Toronto Telegram, and you remember it was the pink telly, because uh, they printed it on pink paper, um, she talks about, um, they, they contacted her because the uh, Telegram correspondent in 1968, uh, 69 was a man named Mark de Villiers, and he was kicked out of the Soviet Union because they didn't like what he was writing. And so they reached out, I guess looked in their files, contacted her. There's a picture of her, uh, more contemporaneous to the period, and she talks about her time, but she also mentions in there that uh, she had written a memoir and she had shopped it around, but no publishers were interested. And this is uh, something that I find just tantalizing, thinking I would love to see this, to find this memoir. I don't know if it's survived in any way, um, but to hear in her own words the account of her remarkable life, I think would be very, very interesting. I'm just about done here. Rhea's last years were, were very, very difficult ones. I said, she went from job to job. She's an older woman. She didn't have a pension, you know. Uh, she, she, we know a little bit about it because um, uh, she, there's a collection of five, five letters uh, written by her that have survived in an archive in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, there are two, two women that she knew from her Soviet days. And she writes to them and she talks about her life and uh, written between 1959 and 1962, and uh, talks about how, well, you know, it's, I get a job, but then I quit because I can't stand it, it's so boring, you know, and I've got these young guys who hire me. I mean, you know, she was totally out of their league uh, half the time, and she just went from job to job, but she needed to make money to survive, and she did it any way she could. Uh, she lived uh, in the Upper East Side in Manhattan, had an apartment there, uh, I have been in touch with relatives who, a relative who used to visit her occasionally with her husband. She was obviously poor. But well, the amazing thing is when you read her letters uh, to, uh, to these women, and also we've just come across a letter written in 1976, five years before she died, to her nephew, where she talks about the fact that, you know, he had written her and sort of suggested maybe you want to invest in my Bramalee Development Corporation uh, company. Um, this was uh, Richard Schiff was, was his name her nephew, uh, and she says, well, you know, uh, I've got a few stocks or whatever, but she had no money really to invest in anything. But she just mentioned sort of in passing that, well, you know, I'm losing my eyesight and my heart isn't very good and I'm trying to get into a senior citizen's home. So her last 20 years, I think, were pretty tough. Uh, but the amazing thing is when she talks about them, she, she, there's not an ounce of self-pity, nothing. She just, matter of fact, this is the way, she chose her path and she lived her life. Um, Rhea died in uh, July 1st, uh, three days before her 77th birthday, 1981, in New York. Uh, haven't been able to get a death certificate. Not a single peep in any of the press about her, including the New York Times, which seems unusual. Uh, she'd been totally forgotten. Uh, it's not known where she's buried. It's not known if she had a even a Jewish funeral. Uh, doubt it, because... Uh, she wasn't religious. She would consider herself an atheist. She did have contact with her family here in Toronto. She would occasionally make visits. Uh, and they've told me, one of the relatives told me that, you know, I remember, he said, I can't physically, 
I can't shut my eyes and see her, but I remember her coming to visit. Uh, she would stay with her sister Rose, but they would fight after a day, and her Rose would be calling everybody saying, take her away, take her away. You can imagine, she was a type AAA personality. She was a driven woman, uh, but a, I think a very, just a compelling figure. She, um, uh, when, when uh, her, her nephew's son, Danny, had his bar mitzvah, she wrote a dedication to him in a book that had an, an article by her. She, uh, we know that she, uh, 1924, so I'm trying to sort of find connections to Jewish community. Uh, there's a reference to her attending a, a junior Hadassah event in 1924 in Toronto, but it doesn't look like she was hung around specifically with organized, uh, Jew, you know, with Jewish organizations, so. Uh, but that's basically her story to now. This is an ongoing research project. There's more stuff to find out about Ria, uh, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Point. Uh, and uh, uh, the other is I'd like to mention that uh, our colleague at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, Serhii Tsipko, has just published a book on the Canadian press and the whole of the more uh, at University of Regina Press. And I think what you would find in that book is a tremendous uh, amount still that did appear and was known in Canada in the 1930s, as well as the disinformation campaign. And so this kind of research, I think, is essential for, for our understanding of, of, of the whole the more and its reception or the reactions in the West. And with that, I would open up for questions. Before, before that, I just want to point this. this is, I just wanted to thank all the people that have contributed to this research. This really is a team project. Uh, people have been, con I've been, I've been able to reach out. Uh, Ksenia Kibushinska has been a huge help here. Marta and Anastasia here as well uh, have been a big help, but uh, it really takes a, a village or a shtetl or a salat to write a book, and I'm working on it. And I just also want to, I should mention my wife, who I'll have to thank because even though I've been spending all this time with Rhea, she hasn't shown any suspicions, <laughs> she's not jealous or nothing, so. Hi, um, thank you for a phenomenal uh, phenomenally enlightening uh, lecture. I'm curious, did she ever write anything about, uh, did she ever write anything uh, about the Holocaust and did she ever write any com any comparative um, articles that m might have uh, said, well, this is, this is a genocide and that the Nazis are committing and, and that I saw a similar thing being committed in Ukraine? No, she, not as far as I know. I haven't come across anything. Again, by the early, late 40s, early 50s, she, her career was sort of already in a downturn. And, uh, uh, but who knows? I said, I'd love to see this. If we can find this manuscript, it would be a really interesting. Well, you said that she lost her leg. Yes. So she was an invalid. You are describing her walking fast in Tbilisi. Um, I mean, these, these these were not the times when they could get prosthetic. So they had, no, she had a she had a prosthetic leg, and you can see pictures of yeah. her, and she wore these woolen stockings well, that you wouldn't so notice. Well, it's more amazing that, that as an as a as an invalid, she was she was doing all of these things. Anybody who's yeah. traveled in Soviet times on Soviet trains, you can imagine what that trip to the far north on trains must have been like, up and down those platforms and stairs and crawling aboard. You know, again, she was. Absolutely remarkable. It, uh, and she doesn't talk about it. She doesn't complain about it. She just lived her life. She never married. Um, she, uh, there is one reference to her having a boyfriend, you know, a Russian boyfriend in Moscow, who got busted for exchanging money on the black market and got sent to the far north uh, to be re-educated at a labor camp. Uh, and that probably was what sparked her to go on this trip to Murmansk and through Karelia to see the to see what conditions were like in those labor camps.
I noticed that uh, most of the articles were from the Telegram. Yes. And I'm just wondering if you found any in the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star or and were rivals. They were rivals, and, and they didn't have they didn't have anything about her at all. Well, um, I think the Globe mentioned her arrest or anything, but of course she was a rival correspondent. And uh, uh, Toronto had about five newspapers then. They had the Mail, the Empire, the Globe, the Star, the Telegram. Um, the Telegram was conservative. It supported R.B. Bennett, who hated communists. Uh, the Star was more liberal, uh, kind of had a pro-Soviet slant to it, mm. elements of it. The Globe was somewhere in the middle. And uh, that's why, and then we looked when uh, Sidhi and I were going through the press, and you compare the Winnipeg Tribune, the Winnipeg Free Press. I mean, they, they're regional colorations, and they're also political shadings to the coverage that they give. Is there anything in the Ukrainian press? Yes. Oh, about her? Yes. Other than that one article about, um, about the... Um, uh, I think Ukrainian Weekly had a little mention of her and also uh, the Ukrainian Communist Press, Robitnichi uh, Visti. Marta. Thank you, that was fascinating. You gave me a little teaser during CAS and now hearing the full story raises even more questions. Um, first of all, how come we didn't know about her before? Second of all, how did she get her stories out? Censorship was quite intense during this period. Uh, a stringer, what, how did she have the contacts? Did, did they go through the diplomatic pouch? Uh, how did she make contacts with that? Um, I'll stop there because I have more, but if you have any insight, because knowing, this, knowing, this just yeah. sounds knowing so how, phenomenal. Knowing how resourceful she was, she obviously, I said, the articles that, uh, in the far north that got her into trouble, and the reason they got into trouble, it's very interesting. Um, there was, the Canadians were, Canadian government and business were very upset that the Brits were buying lumber, cheap lumber, from the Soviet Union. And the argument was is that this is slave labor that's producing is how can we compete? These guys are political prisoners. They harvest the wood for nothing. They process it and it's a shorter trip and everything. How can Canadian lumber compete with them? The fact that she was able to actually document that prison labor was being used for producing this lumber really pissed them off. And that's what, that's what, that's what, that's what they were responding to when they, when they uh, um, banished her. The, the fact that she was a, f a freelancer, a stringer, that she wasn't attached to a major news organization also, I think, made her vulnerable, the fact that she was a woman. Uh, and when you read about the journalists in Moscow at that time, it was a boys' club. Uh, Duranty, Chamberlain, Eugene Lyons, uh, they all hung around together and everything like that. She was the odd, she was an odd duck in that midst, but she didn't seem to let any, th any of that bother her. Uh, she, uh, the articles that, uh, about her trip through the famine lands, as I said, they confiscated her stuff when she was kicked out of the country. They gave her two days to go back to uh, London to pack her belongings. Uh, it's amazing, but mo guess who arrived the day before she got back to Moscow was Malcolm Muggeridge. And he showed up at her apartment as she was packing and in his diary describes uh, his first impressions were that she's kind of a pathetic, you know, she'd lost a bunch of hair, obviously stressed. and and things like that. Uh, and then was more, in the second little reference to her, was much more complimentary of her. Uh, Malcolm Muggeridge is, by the way, his aunt was Beatrice Webb, Lady Passfield. This is all pretty incestuous stuff. But I think that um, she, I think she just reached the point where uh, the censor, all the writers understood that the stuff was being censored, so you self-censored if you wanted to get something out. But she was able, obviously, to smuggle some articles out through some traveler or something who took them out and mailed them. And, so, and some of the journalists managed to do this on period, periodically. But that's how those articles got out. And then the other ones were written already in the West. Can I ask another one? <laughs> uh, do we know what Durante thought of her? You mentioned in your lecture that she uh, was friends with him. They were colleagues. Is there any reference to her in any of his writings? They must have had some pretty hot conversations, given what he was publishing what she was publishing. And one more question, do we know if she had any contact with government? Did she send any information to Canadian government or British Foreign Office or anything, um, you know, along the lines of journalists putting one thing in the newspaper, but did she reach out to government? And you didn't answer my first question, why did we not know about her before? Didn't know about her because nobody went through the press page by page the way we did and stumbled upon uh, these articles, really. 
That's, that's basically what it amounted to. Um, Walter Duranti, don't forget that she was working for him in the first nine months of 1929, so this is before things really got ugly. Uh, it's an open question, that, that relationship. Uh, Alice, uh, Sally um, Taylor in her book, uh, Stalin's Apologist, has some, I've read it with great interest, there's no reference to Rhea in it. Uh, he does talk about another a, a young man who came and worked as uh, Durante's assistant, assistant and explained basically he was, Durante exploited these people, paid them, uh, but this guy had to always harangue him to get his money. Every month or every two weeks when he was supposed to get paid, he'd have to bug him and remind him and he'd finally cough up the money. Uh, and that they did a lot of the running around for him. Now, um, it is also described how, I mean, he was a womanizer. He drank, he did drugs. I mean, he was a hellion journalist of his day. Uh, and um, they talk about the fact that a lot of young women were seduced by him or he or threw themselves at him or something like that. So the question arises, did she have to cater to him sexually or whatever to get and hold her job? It's unknown. I, no, judging her character, she might have told him to jump in a lake if he hit, tried to hit on her. Who knows? Who really knows? The only reference she makes to him is in later years, she, ta she, qu she quotes him uh, sort of amusingly saying uh, that he always said that what you write is irrelevant because in, ten in two weeks or whatever, people are going to forget about it anyway. So he, had this, he was a cynic, and he was even cynical about his own work in the journalistic profession. So she cites that, but she does it without any animosity or anything like that. So what, her, what their relationship was is, is an open question. Uh, what else there was? There was anything? Oh, government. Um, well, she obviously, listen, yeah. Um, the uh, British consul, and Canada didn't have an embassy then. I mean, the British uh, embassy was our embassy in Moscow. Uh, the British consul in uh, Leningrad was a man named Reader Bullard, and in his diaries and in his dispatches to the British Foreign Office had some fascinating descriptions of Rhea because on her way to the far north, she stopped by, and then he debriefed her on their way back, and he was very impressed with her. He thought, he said, man, this woman, you know, all, other journalists have gone, and there were other, there was another Canadian journalist who traveled in the far north, uh, Pierre Van Passen, about the same time that she was there, within a matter of weeks, he described, he saw no signs of slave labor. Everything was fine. What, you know, what's the, what's the big fuss all about? Um, she, so he praises her, and uh, both in his um, uh, dispatches, but also in his uh, uh, diary accounts of her. He mentions uh, also when, she, when uh, Shaw visit, uh, the Shaw visit, he interviewed her, and I guess she had hoped to get a big interview published with him, but uh, it didn't happen. Uh, so um, she did have contacts with the British Embassy. When she embarked on this trip in the car with these two women, uh, Ove, the uh, British uh, ambassador, basically said, look, where are you going to get gas? Where are you going to sleep? Well, there are no roads where you're going. You know, you're going to get 100 miles out of here and you're going to come crawling back. This is what he told those women. Uh, Walter Durante told her, cynic that he was, he had already written her obituary and it was a good one. That was before they embarked on that big trip. So uh, there, are two, there are some things in the uh, Mackenzie uh, King papers from the 30s, though, from the times that she, the time that she was in Germany. Do you have a um, a sense of what the reception of her work was like in Toronto from her writings, and also, uh, you know, because in one sense, if all of these writers ignored her, 21 articles is a real commitment from the newspaper, especially to write what she was writing, or to publish what she was writing. And do you have a sense uh, from what she wrote or anybody wrote about her of what her philosophy or outlook was? She sounds very goal-oriented. Um. She was driven. Um, the um, other newspapers mostly ignored her because they had their own journalists who they sent to get the real story. And of course, they went for a few weeks and they got shown around. But of course, they said, that, no, 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 we could go anywhere we wanted to and we could write anything we wanted to. And, whatever, but they needed an interpreter, they needed a driver, they needed all this stuff. She was able to go by that time on her own, and she could blend in, she could pass as a Soviet. And uh, she had the language, she had the look or whatever. So um, uh, most of the other papers I said just ignored. Uh, this was competition, it was a different narrative that, uh, they were, than, than the one that they were pushing through their newspapers. 
Uh, there were a huge number of articles. There was, you also get there was 18 articles in the Toronto Telegram written by an engineer who spent two years there and who came out and said, it's a disaster. There's no food. The, they treat the, the secret police are everywhere. The uh, factories that they're building are falling apart. They're, you know, the, the five-year plan is a failure. Uh, the, he wrote 18 articles. And, and we're talking, Ria's articles, we're talking front page, you know, 1,200, 1,500, 1,800 words. These are not news bites, sound bites. These are detailed accounts, uh, as were the articles that appeared in the Globe by these other journalists and, and in the Star. Uh, so... Um, Oh, letters to the editor. That's the most interesting thing. First thing that struck me was is that I would thought, I would think that there would be more communists and Ukrainian communists writing in challenging this. There's very little response. They didn't really need to because other people were getting the message across for them, I guess. But, but you, there are a couple of telling letters that speak volumes when people start writing and saying, we don't know what to believe. There are these people go and they say the place is wonderful, that it's the future, that we're going to have a centrally planned economy like theirs eventually, that uh, uh, they're building, we're here, we're in crisis, there's a, a depression, people are hungry and everything. There, things are getting better and better, they're building, you know, uh, and, and others are saying that this place is terrible. We don't know what to believe. And then you realize the propaganda has won, they've hooked them. Um, Robert Crumb is a good example. He was the publisher of the Vancouver Sun. He flies into Moscow, uh, January or uh, July of 1933. Uh, goes to the horse races. Talks about he says, yeah, there were lineups at kiosks every morning to buy uh, newspapers. You know, basically portrayed it as a normal place. Uh, and then said people in Moscow were saying that there was a, a famine in Ukraine. But I heard also that people in Ukraine were saying there's a famine in Moscow. You decide. And he just sort of glibly. Uh, tossed his hands up, you know, and he went around speaking. After he came back, he spoke in Saskatoon. You know, these, there also you have the articles, you have speaking tours by these people, uh, and of course people like um, uh, this Pierre Van Passen and uh, uh, Griffin or whatever. Some of them uh, uh, gave gave talks, and there's there's a whole speech, you know, like a lecture circuit. People went around. Um, Will Durant. This is also there are regional differences in Canada are, are also very important. Will Durant made it to the West Coast after his trip through the Soviet Union, where he went, was a strong communist sympathizer, and came out after a couple of months there saying, this is horrible. This is not the society that I fought for. Gave a speech in, Ham in, uh, in uh, Vancouver before about 1,200 people. Booed, whistled, people yelling, whatever the communist community came out to, to try to discredit him. A big two-page spreads in the Vancouver Sun. I mean, this is a big news story. Uh, so you have these contradictory things, but the end result was, as people said, we don't know what to believe. Well, you can see, right, I think it goes right back to her character as a little girl. Here's a girl, little girl who lost her leg and it didn't seem to slow her down, uh, who had to self-educate. She even attended the University of Toronto. Uh, I checked with alumni here, alumni here, and there was no record of her actually being here. And uh, Beatrice Webb even mentions that she studied at the University of Toronto under some friends of hers, but she never got a, a degree or anything. She might have just sat in on classes or, or audited some classes. Um, but you know, uh, traveling, a wom single woman uh, traveling to New York, to London, to Paris, to Berlin, to uh, Moscow. I mean. Uh, in Moscow, I should also mention, while she was in Russia, she, she knew Alexandra Kolontai. She interviewed Krupskaya, Lenin's widow. She uh, was driven home after some function at the Kremlin by Mikhail Kalinin, the prime minister, in his chauffeur-driven car. I mean, she was well-connected. She also was the only Canadian journalist to attend the wedding of uh, Wallace Simpson and Edward, uh, which I know for Canadians is very important to know this. So. Aside from the memoir, an obituary, and a burial place, what is it that you would think may still be out there that you would like to discover? Uh, 
I said, because she was poor, I mean, who knows, she might be buried in a pauper's grave and they might have just tossed her stuff, whatever she had. There is a, a listing of un, unclaimed properties, which I've tried to encourage the family to access. I have a feeling it's just maybe old stocks or bonds or something that are totally meaningless or worthless now uh, that's left. But um, uh, you keep trying. I mean, I, uh, I did manage, I did some digging and I managed to track down a relative of this Mary Dejeev, who the photographer who traveled with them on this trip. Uh, and she had a career as a photographer and documentary filmmaker afterwards. And I'd love to, to know if her pictures, uh, the originals, because um, uh, Rhea got scooped by the other woman, Alva Christensen. And uh, uh, she published a series of eight articles, not just the, first of describing how they got to Russia, then about this trip. And then they continued on after Rhea was arrested. Uh, Alva Christensen's very interesting. She makes mention of Rhea twice. One, she talks about how the OGPU, they, the government offered her a government translator and guide, and they said, no, we don't want somebody with the secret police. They then said, well, we'll get the Soviet Motor Association. They'll provide a guide and a thing. She said, no, we don't want somebody with the secret police. They had heard about Rhea. They must have met her, and they said, we want this woman. They said, okay. So that's how Rhea ended up with her. And then she says, and that was a mistake. Uh, even though those women would have done nothing without her. There's no doubt. And then the second reference is, is when they mention that uh, she was arrested and all, they, all she says is, and it didn't surprise us. So I think she was, a, there were two type A personalities in there and uh, they obviously, and a, a road trip like that, pretty brutal, sleeping under the car at times, you know, thing breaking down. I mean, my God, what, a, what an adventure they had. We have some coffee and sweets, so you're gonna get a chance to, to ask questions uh, later privately or personally with, uh, with Yars. Uh, we have a, a few, a little clip we would like to show you as well. So first I would like to thank this Yars Balan for this wonderful presentation and wonderful research. And then I'd like to ask Marta Baziuk to, to introduce the clip. Just briefly, based on Yars' incredible research, the Holodomor National Awareness Tour, you might know it better as the Holdemore Bus Project. The Holdemore National Awareness Tour uh, took upon itself to make a film about Rhea Kleiman, and it will become known to you more publicly, but this is just to give you a two-minute taste of the film. To Comrade M. Yagoda, you accused me of sending out alarming reports about the famine in the villages. But the children in the villages of the Ukraine were eating grass when I saw them a few months ago. Theft of a few ears of corn from the collective farms is punishable by death. You have successfully muzzled and cowed the Russian people by bullying and terror. You tried this on me but I recant nothing. What, are going to go I think that Putin's attitude towards truth and towards the media is very deeply connected to his training as a KGB officer. And it does go back to the original, some of the original ideas of not just Stalin, but of the Bolsheviks. One of the things that I found striking looking at the press of the period is you realize how things have changed and how things are the same. While the masses are starving, the Kremlin is gorging itself with food. There is a greed for power and power that breeds privileges. There will be a day of reckoning.
Okay, I'd like to remind you about the two events. That is one this Sunday in distant Scarborough, so we hope that some of the Ukrainian community can make it there. Of course, that's the center of the Armenian community. It's at their center. You have flyers out there. On December the 8th, uh, the talk on uh, Yiddish memoirs of the Holodomor, uh, and uh, try, that'll be here, of course, at the Monk Center. Seventh, I'm sorry, you know, Pearl Harbor Day. It's December the 7th. Uh, and then I'd also like to uh, remind you that on Thursday at UNO, there will be a launch of the fourth volume of Hrushevsky, the translation of the history of Ukraine Rus, and uh, would ask you, uh, if you could, to please try and join us there as well. There are always many, many events in, in Toronto, of course. Uh, and uh, I would also, above all, like to thank uh, the sponsors who make possible work on the Hello the More, uh, you've seen the many organizations that contribute to this, and above all, to thank uh, our lecturer for a brilliant presentation and wonderful research. I, to I told Botan and Ischuk that I'll mention the video that you saw a little clip of will be available shortly for purchase, uh, so keep an eye out for it. And uh, uh, there's a version that they're showing on the bus, and there's a longer version as well that's uh, uh, been made and it's been dubbed into Ukrainian as well. So, oh, and uh, yes, the Vitaly uh, uh, Klitschko or yes, Vitaly, which one? Volodymyr. The one of the the one is the mayor of Kiev. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a push to get a street in Kiev named after Ria, uh, and it looks like it's going to happen. And I've been pushing that uh, Kharkiv and Slovyansk could also appropriately have streets named after her. Okay. And please join us for a small reception for coffee and, and dessert and talk with our lecturer.